Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the SIPSI, the first SIPSI seminar for 2022. Um, at the start of our 2022 seminar series on what do we need to change in building services for zero net carbon. Uh, tonight we've got Jaisal Patel and Tate Benito from JetCharge um, with a very interesting seminar on EV charging technology. Uh, firstly, we'll just run through some introduction slides for SIPSI. Uh, firstly, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I stand today, Jar Jar Waring people, and also acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, the SIPSI Young Engineers Awards is open for entries. Um, the event is being held on 6 p.m. on Wednesday, the 6th of April, 2022. So head to the website to uh, vote. Now, 2022 ANZ seminar series, going from great to good raising the tide for all buildings new and old, uh, calling for papers. Um, the event will be held on starting 30th of August, 2022, continuing with five sessions uh, each Tuesday until the 27th of September, 2022. So if you have any topics or papers, please submit. Um, I'm looking forward to it. Last year was a very excellent event. And we've now just got a video for Connexus Recruitment. So now we've got our, our events. Actually, I just hope that the sound was working for everyone there. I've had some technical difficulties and I wasn't getting it, but hopefully it worked for everyone else. Um, so now we've got our, our event for tonight. So we've got Jaisal and Tate from JetCharge presenting EV charging technology. Uh, Tate uh, is going to start tonight. Tate has worked extensively in residential brownfield developments, working with owners, corporations and OC managers to retrofit scalable and innovative EV charging solutions in, in their buildings and is very experienced. Uh, Jaisal uh, has seven years of experience with designing lighting, power and communication systems for greenfield, commercial, residential, high-rise, fit-out and hospital uh, upgrade projects. Uh, so tonight they're going to be tag teaming uh, with a very interesting seminar. So I'm going to stop sharing um, and I'm going to hand it over to Tate, who's going to start for the night um, and hope everyone enjoys it. Uh, before Actually before, uh, there's a QA and a section in the bottom. So if you have any questions, please fill that out throughout the night and we'll run through that at the end. Thanks everyone and over to you Tate. Thanks very much, Matt. Uh, thanks for the introduction there. And yeah, welcome everyone. I've uh, got a good session uh, around EV charging and how that relates to building services. So I'll just share my screen. And yeah, so with the link to what do we need to change uh, in building services for net zero carbon, uh, I'm sure you're all aware that uh, electric vehicles are a great way to achieve that. And we'll delve into that uh, in a bit more detail.
here's just a summary of what we're going to go over today. So we'll start off by presenting a bit of information around the Australian EV market and uh, how that relates to achieving net zero in um, carbon emissions in buildings. Uh, we then got an introductory session on EV charging, going through all the standard plug types, their use cases um, and charge rates. We'll then really focus in on load management, and this is um, a really important uh, and scalable piece of technology that allows us to uh, provision for large numbers of EV charging systems in, um, you know, in a range of commercial and residential buildings. We'll then have a small section on uh, billing and solar and V2G integration with EV charging. Uh, the billing becomes important uh, for scenarios where there's lots of users um, owning individual charges, maybe in a residential setting where each individual needs to be billed for their individual energy consumption. And solar and V2G is more of an insight into what the future may look like and um, what synergies might be available uh, in those corresponding uh, technology sectors. So to introduce the topic for tonight, we'd like to accelerate the adoption of zero emission transport um, by making it easier in, uh, in commercial and residential buildings to promote EV uptake. Um, so that might be anything from individual owners owning uh, electric vehicles in residential apartment settings or to um, corporate fleets where they want to transition to an electric fleet and um, looking at what building services are going to be required uh, to facilitate that transition. As a starting point, um, the transport sector was responsible for 18% of Australia's greenhouse gas emissions in 2020. So if we really want to achieve that um, net zero output of building for buildings, uh, we want to tackle the, the um, transport within those buildings. So as you can see there, cars, passenger vehicles represent 47% of that um, green, those greenhouse gas emissions from 2020 of the 18% of the um, transport sector. And um, they're really the immediate um, feasible target for, for reducing those emissions um, significantly. Uh, that's because currently the, the makes and models of um, electric vehicles are really targeted at that passenger fleet sector. Um, and we'll soon see to see, soon see more trucks and buses like commercial vehicles being available. Um, there are still certainly um, some available, but it's more in the uh, passenger vehicle fleet where there's plenty of options. Here's a snapshot of the Australian EV market um, and how it's grown in the last few years. Uh, you can really see the spike in, from 2020 to 2021. I'm sure you're all uh, familiar with seeing EVs more in the news, and that also corresponds with just a, a three times jump in um, electric vehicle new car sales, which currently make up 2% of new vehicle sales in the country. So you can see it was pretty flat for 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020 again, and now really jumped up in the last year um, to about 20,000 vehicles sold. Contrasting that to overseas, uh, there's a bit of a way to go, a bit of catch up for us to uh, make up for in Australia. You can see Norway is leading the charge at 72% of um, new vehicle sales being electric. And then you know, some of those European countries behind them, Sweden, Netherlands, Germany, all above 25%. The UK is sitting around 15%. Um, so they're yeah, all at least a couple of years ahead of us um, in that transition to um, electric vehicles being uh, more prol proliferated um, on, on the roads. In terms of EV sales by manufacturer, this is pretty um, staggering a bar graph here. We see that Tesla Model 3 accounted for 12,000 of the approximately 20,000 sales this year. And that uh, equates to about 60% of uh, new vehicle sales with, with Tesla Model 3s. You can see the MG ZS EV uh, was the second most popular. And that's actually the most um, affordable EV on the market coming in around $40,000. So not, not surprising that that is, the, um, is, is up there with the, with the highest um, makes and models sold. We then got a, a plug-in hybrid um, Mitsubishi Outlander and a number of other um, popular models. But yeah, you can see that overwhelmingly uh, the Tesla Model 3 um, uh, is, is the greatest seller. And that's also because of the, the numbers of vehicles that they'll actually um, export and send over to Australia um, for sale. Um, whereas a lot of these other manufacturers only send over small batches um, given that they get a much higher demand in other countries. Which leads us into the federal policies and incentives. Um, just a quick snapshot as to what the uh, federal government and how they're acting um, in relation to this sector. So they're committing to investment in public charging infrastructure. So they've committed $24.55 million 
for um, fast charging stations, so DC rapid charging stations to be installed in um, public locations, uh, predominantly metro locations, and they want to install 400 of them um, to, I guess, appease um, EV drivers and the general public's thoughts about range anxiety, thinking they won't be able to drive long distances. They've also committed to co-investment with the private sector to fund 50,000 charging stations in Australian homes. So that could be anything from a, um, a domestic charger for someone to have in their garage so that they can part, charge their vehicle overnight uh, to an apartment charging system uh, for a residential apartment. A uh, really relevant one to, to the um, discussion today is EV readiness in building development. So the Australian Building Codes Board is currently undergoing um, a draft update of the National Construction Code. There was some um, um, discussion around there being a requirement in residential apartment buildings over a certain um, over a certain height or number of stories to be provisioned for up to 25% car spaces for EV charging. Uh, so that means that they'll need to have things like space for cable tray, space for distribution boards, power allocated um, for up to 25% of EV um, of, of car spaces to be fitted with EV chargers. There's still some way to go to that. I think I think that final um, uh, release comes out in, in May, so we'll know more about exactly what um, EV provisioning requirements will be included in the National Construction Code then, uh, but that will certainly, um, we, we, we expect and hope that will really accelerate that uptake of EVs and um, considering EV charging in, in um, building development. In terms of state policies and incentives, um, there's a number of states that have rebates or subsidies um, when you purchase an electric vehicle, but a lot of the, a lot of these have a cap um, for the value of the vehicle. So you can't get a couple of thousand dollar subsidy from the government if you're buying a hundred fifty thousand dollar vehicle, which makes sense. But most of those caps sit around the fifty eight sixty eight thousand dollar mark, um, which there's a number of EVs that fall within that price range. And so yeah, New South Wales, Queensland, SA, Vic, they all offer a three thousand dollar subsidy, and there's a cap as to how many vehicles that's offered to. Um, in the ACT, they're kind of the leading the charge. You can get a $15,000 interest-free loan and you can also get two years free registration for your electric vehicle. In terms of government fleet targets, this will also be a real driver for um, electric vehicle uptake because we know that the fleet sector pushes a lot of vehicles into the second-hand market. So you see that the ACT is saying that from now on, 100% um, of new government fleet leases are going to be zero emission. Currently, that, that means electric vehicle. Um, where they're fit for purpose. So where they might not be fit for purpose might be when there's say, um, an ambulance that doesn't currently have a, a suitable replacement uh, as a zero emission vehicle. So mostly at the, for the time being, that'll be focused on the passenger fleet. You can see New South Wales are committed to 100% passenger fleet to be electric by 2030 with a target of 50% um, by 2026. Queensland SA and Vic have all um, committed to similarly phasing into zero emission transport fleets um, by around 2026, 2030 and 2035. So we can see in the next year, we, we can expect to see in the next five to 10 years, a real acceleration um, and yeah, expected that to um, play more in line with what we see as the EV uptake rates of those um, overseas European countries that I showcased showed you earlier. Now to jump into EV charging and um, just get on top of some terms and standards and that sort of thing. Um, we've got the different EV charging plug types. So there's both AC and DC charging. Um, AC charges are the slower uh, type of um, charging available, whereas DC is much faster. This is because, as, as you'll know, our grid runs on AC. Um, so when we're getting uh, power to the charger, that power will be in the AC form. The vehicles then have an onboard rectifier that converts that AC power into um, the DC power that's required for the um, to charge the battery in the vehicle. The the charge rate for these AC vehicles, AC charges are then um, limited to the I guess um, the functionality of that onboard rectifier. Whereas the DC charges, they can bypass that rectifier and just go direct straight to the battery, which means that they have a much um, higher charge rate that can be um, accepted by the vehicle. So when, when we discuss AC, there's two plug types. There's the type one standard and the type two standard. Uh, type one was for early generation EVs in Australia and New Zealand from 2010 to 2018. It's mainly used in US and Japanese markets and it can only charge at single phase AC. 
type two is um, what we're all using now. So that's the agreed standard from 2018. Um, and that's also been adopted in the European markets. It supports single and three phase charging. Um, and so there, that's what that's what the majority of EV chargers um, being installed and being um, specified at the moment are. Then when we talk about DC chargers, we've got two types there again, um, again, kind of in line with the, the different um, markets around the world. So there's the Chatamo mark, um, plug type, which is native to the Japanese market and um, yeah, accepted as the standard in Japan and typically charges at around 300, around 50 kilowatts. Whereas the other DC plug type um, is the combined charging system type two, CCS2, and that can support up to 350 kilowatts charging. And that's the adopted standard in Australia from late 2018. And um, the one that you'll see in Europe as well. In terms of the speed that these uh, plug types can offer, uh, the type one AC plug, can, given it's limited to single phase, can provide around 20 to 50 kilometers of range per hour of charge. And this will depend on you know, what um, power it's connected at. It can typically go up to 32 amp single phase. And so depending on the efficiency of the vehicle battery, the, the more efficient vehicles might be able to get up to 50 kilometers. A lot of vehicles will probably be capped at around the 30 kilometers per um, hour of charge. In terms of uh, type two AC plug types, uh, because you have the three phase capacity there, you can get up to 120, even 150 for a really efficient electric vehicle, um, 150 kilometers of range per hour of charge. Um, but the difficulty here is that a lot of vehicles, um, whilst they might be, have a type two socket um, and they might be a type two vehicle, they may not be able to accept the full, say 32 amp three phase charge rate. Only a lot of the premium car manufacturers um manufactured vehicles that can support that so a lot of vehicles are kind of capped at 16 amp three phase or even just capped at um 32 amp single phase in terms of the dc plugs uh the chatamo given that it um has about 50 kilowatts on offer can provide around 250 kilometers of range per hour of charge and yeah when we go to ccs2 if we get a vehicle that can support up to you know, 300, 350 kilowatts um, on, on DC charge, then they can obtain up to 1600 kilometers of range per hour of charge. So this is where we're getting to that really fast um, refueling and you'll get up to 80% charge in, in 10, 15 minutes. Um, so yeah, you can really see the difference in the, uh, in the charge rates from the DC charges to the AC charges. In terms of the AC charger types, um, two common common types, you've got an, a tethered unit uh, where you'll have the cable attached to the charger and that cable will then have a type one or a type two plug at the end of that with the pins um, uh, corresponding to the, to the um, pictures I showed you earlier. And this can only be compatible with the, with the vehicle um, that has the corresponding plug um, that connects to that uh, plug type. Whereas we've also got AC socket chargers. Um, the most popular of these and the most universal is now the type two socket charger. Uh, and this is because it allows the user to bring their own cable. So a type one vehicle and a type two vehicle can both plug into this type two socket charger um, because you can get an adapter that has a type two connector to go into the type two socket and then a type one or a type two connector on the other end uh, to go into the electric vehicle. And so these are the most popular chargers to be installed in uh, in public settings uh, because they allow for universal charging. Anyone can drive up and, and plug their vehicle in and, and obtain a charge if they've got their required cable. There's also a differentiation between smart and dumb chargers. So dumb chargers are essentially just a high power um, socket. Um, just, you know, you just have to size the cabling to it and you plug in, um, you can plug and play, we call it. You just plug the cable into the um, vehicle and it'll charge. So that doesn't have any internet connectivity or ability for remote control. Um, and we typically see this used in, in domestic settings where we can just run a circuit from someone's um, home switchboard and they can you know, plug in, plug out whenever they need. When it comes to smart charging, this, this allows us to have internet connectivity, remote monitoring and control. And this becomes really important for complex and large scale EV charging systems where maybe we need to monitor the aggregate load of the EV chargers um, and control the EV charging load um, within safe limits of building architect or building electrical infrastructure, uh, along with if we want to be able to access the data um, around the charge sessions, maybe how much consumption um, each charge session, session is used, 
um, to allow for further data insights about um, fleet management and those sorts of things. In terms of um, smart charging, there's a, um, a global communication standard uh, called the Open Charge Point Protocol, the OCPP. Um, and this is the language that um, EV chargers use to speak with um, software systems. And so this is the kind of open source we, we refer to it in, in a similar vein, open source system for EV chargers. There are other propri proprietary um, communication systems, uh, but the global standard is this OCPP compliant system. And this is really important in, in building design. Um, if you want the, the end user to be able to have flexibility in which type of chargers they use, if you want them to be able to have both AC and DC chargers, high and fast, um, slow and fast chargers, um, and be able to integrate chargers of different manufacturers, um, then this is really important that all the systems that be implemented follow the OCPP um, protocol. And, and then an important point there is it doesn't lock buildings into any hardware or software manufacturers. Here's a quick snapshot of the different um, charges and their charge rates. Uh, so you can see, you can get a trickle charger, um, gives you about 10 kilometers per hour. That's essentially just a, something that plugs into a general um, 10 amp GPO, and that can operate up to 2.4 kilowatts. Um, it's you know really only suitable for overnight charging, um, and it's still even overnight gonna take you a long time to charge your vehicle. Uh, but most vehicles come with one of these portable chargers when you purchase them. Um, and so a lot of people will just decide to keep that portable charger uh, and use that as their charging um, system. We then move into the AC chargers from about 3.6 kilowatts to 22 kilowatts, depending on if it's single or three phase. Um, and they're what we call fast chargers, 40 to 40 kilometers to 120 kilometers. You can see they're getting a bit bigger, but they have a range of profiles um, depending on their use case. The one, the, the one on the left and in the middle, they're more use um, for um, interior systems and um, home charging units. Uh, whereas the one on the right is more of an industrial, good for outdoor use, it's robust um, and high rated. We've then got the rapid chargers, which is when we start getting into DC charging um, from 25 kilowatts onwards. Um, the one on the left in the rapid section there you see is a 25 kilowatt unit. And then we go up a bigger unit to a 50 kilowatt. And these can give you 150 to 300 kilometers an hour. So really good for, for quick top ups. Um, you can really top up your vehicle with you know half an hour to an hour of charge at one of these stations. And then there's the ultra rapid that provide you know 500 kilometers plus, um, depending on what the vehicle can take. And they can go up to 350 kilometer, 50, 350 kilowatts. Now thinking about where we'd um, install these charges and the different use cases. Uh, we've got residential applications, um, so that might be a home charger um, just in a regular house, or it might be a um, residential apartment setting. And typically we find that in those settings, the EV chargers can occur, EV charging can occur overnight because owners simply need to plug in their vehicle when they get home from work um, to make sure it's ready to go by the next day. Obviously that's changed a bit um, with these COVID times. Um, which also just means that they've probably got more time. They're, they're probably at home um, for a longer duration. So they've got more, um, a, lo a longer time frame where they can achieve that charge. But often again, overnight charging is preferred because you get a lower, um, uh, you get the off peak tariff, so you can charge at a cheaper rate. And typically these, these charge sessions, sessions can be short. If you if you plug in your vehicle each day, then you likely only need to top up you know, 20, 30, 50 kilometers maybe. The, the Australian average driving distance per day is around 50 kilometers. Um, so normally one to two hours of charge each night um, will be sufficient to top up um, an electric vehicle for the next day in a residential setting. We've then got fleet back to base. Um, so this might be fleet vehicles in, in a business or an organization um, where they again park overnight because they'd be in use during the day and then they'd um, be returned to um, the, the fleet base overnight. And then you could plug them all in um, and then you just need to make sure that um, there's enough power to the EV charging systems and uh, that, that they can recoup that, um, the daily commute that they've done. So a lot of analysis will need to go into that, into those fleets um, to understand what their driving behavior is and to see um, how much um, overnight charge they need to be assured to, to keep them operating as required. There's then also a lot of settings where you might have a, a vehicle fleet and you might have, um, you know, the, the regular passenger vehicles, but you might have then some really high 
priority maybe of emergency vehicles that um, are, are, yeah the highest priority to always be charged so you might then look at incorporating a dc a fast charging station uh, rapid charger into the the setup there so that when they get back to base they can quickly um, top up the vehicle make it fully charged so that if they do need to jet out quickly um, the the vehicle is fully topped up and operational and then another setting we see is employee charging um, so a lot of businesses might offer um, ev charging to their employees and this is really variable it can they might want to offer an ac charger charge port for um for ev drivers the employees and that's perfectly suitable chances are they'll be plugged in and charging for, for a lot of the day uh, maybe they want to also offer a premium offering where they give a, a dc charger and they can really top up quick and, and cycle through a number of um, employee vehicles during the day. I'm now going to hand over to Chase Sal, who's going to um, talk through some design considerations. Um, and over to you, Chase Sal. On mute. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jaisal. Um, I'm a project engineer here at JetCharge, and I'm just going to go over the design considerations of um, how we design and the provision for EV charging systems for a, a wide variety of buildings um, here in Australia. So um, next slide, please. Um, typically, um, a building services engineer would use AS3000 2018 Appendix P to use as a guidance for the installation and location, locations of electric vehicle charging stations. Now, Appendix P typically provides guidance for circuits intended to supply energy to electric vehicles, best installation practices, and upstream protection requirements. Next slide, please. Um, Essentially, we need to go over a few definitions of um, what is detailed in AS3000 Appendix B with, in terms of um, what types of charging there are. So there essentially there are three modes of charging defined under AS3000, mode two, mode three, and mode four charging. Um, and essentially how you can differentiate between the three is that mode two is a standard socket outlet with an in cords control and protective device fault protect um yeah protected ev cable so essentially there's an inline cord protection device within the charging cable um, which provides control and protection for that circuit mode three is essentially you have a permanently connected ac um, charger and mode four is typically for dc ev supply equipment so next slide please we have Essentially, this is the actual definition of um, mode two charging according to AS3000, which is essentially we connect to a standardized single phase or three phase socket outlet with a inline control pilot function and a system of personal protection against electric shocks. So typically these charges come with electric vehicles when you buy them from the factory. So Tesla typically provide their own version of a inline mode two charger. And if you wanted to have faster charging, you would have to typically step up to a mode three or a mode four charger. Next slide, please. So with mode three charging, you have a connection, a, a dedicated connection to the EV charging equipment, in this case, an AC charger, where the control equipment and the um, cabling is within the charger itself. From the charger, there is an AC cable that runs to the car where the AC to DC rectifier within the car um, provides charge to the battery. So typically the charge rate is dictated by the car's supported um, rectifier. So essentially a Tesla Model 3 will have an 11 kilowatt rectifier. So even if you connect a 22 kilowatt three phase charger and you have the dedicated supply available to it, it will only be able to charge to 11 kilowatts. Next slide, please. Mode four charging is um, when you connect an AC supply network mains to an offboard charger where the AC to DC rectifier is located within the charging unit itself. And there is a DC to DC cable that provides direct power to the car, which basically bypasses the inline AC to DC rectifier, allowing for a quicker charge. Next slide. So insulation. When we look at a dedicated um, an EV charging station, we have to provide what's called a dedicated circuit um, that's rated at the capacity of the EV charger. So essentially a seven kilowatt charger will be a single phase 32 amp dedicated circuit and 22 kilowatts will be three phase 22, uh, 32 amps. Um, every socket outlet should be located as close as practically possible 
to the EV charging space because um, cables typically don't go past 10 meters and then they have difficulties with connection and usage. Um, they typically have a minimum of IP44 rating on them so that they are protected against humidity, water, and um, dust. So um, if, if you are um, designing a charging station or a charging system where um, there is a potential for rain and dust to come into the charging station, then obviously you would have to design the charging station to be at least IP44 rated. Um, in areas where there are public car parks or car parks that are um, prone to mechanical damage, where there is essentially a risk of vandalism, um, you would have to position the charges to ensure that it can avoid any um, reasonable foreseeable impacts, for example, trafficable areas, or have bollards or wheel stops located so that they can be protected against significant damage from other cars or people. Um, also, they should essentially have a minimum IK rating of IK07 so that it can protect against um, van vandalism as well. Next slide, please. Um, so now let's go into the electrical design. Um, and electric vehicle charge, um, designs are done in a wide variety of um, ways. So this is just one of the ways where you have an LV switchboard feeding the distribution board feeding EV chargers, and then you have dedicated circuits to each EV. Um, an electric vehicle charging station typically complies to the safety measures of IEC 60364-7-722, and which is a bit of a mouthful, and provides protection against short circuits, electric shocks, and over voltages, where each charger will be provided with a dedicated circuit, a dedicated circuit breaker, and obviously, this is a very important point. Upstream protection must always be in line with the manufacturer's instructions. So before you specify any charger, please read through the um, manufacturer's instructions on what they recommend is the best form of protection for that charger. Because if these safety measures are not complied with, there's a risk that the user will be either exposed to overheating, electric shock, or fire. Next slide, please. So now we go on to the safety measures that we spoke about earlier, protection against electric shock. Um, so typically a, an EV charger is located in very public areas, outdoors in the presence of water, children, where um, the, the possibility of electric shock can be quite high. So we need to consider that when we design our protection against electric shock. So we typically use what's called a 30 milliamp RCD. Next slide, please. A 30 milliamp RCD. Um, comes in a few forms, but typically for EV charging, we use two types of RCDs, what's called a type A RCD, which is typically used in a wide variety of electric showers, ovens, um, immersion heaters, and tungsten lighting. Um, and type B RCDs are mostly used in inverters, UPS, photovoltaic systems, lifts, etc. How they differ, please, next slide. How they differ is essentially the type B RCD comes in comes with built-in um, DC fault protection um, up to over six milliamps. What that essentially means is that it is able to detect any DC residual current of over six milliamps and safely stop the charging session, which the type A RCD does not have. So when you design your charging station um, system, you would have to ensure that the charger that you specify either has an RDC-DD, which is essentially a residual direct current detection device, um, and if it does not, or if you cannot confirm that they have the R RDCDD, you should specify what's called a type B RCD, which has an implication on your distribution board because a typical type B RCD cannot fit on a typical MCB chassis. Um, so you would have to have a DIN rail to mount your type B RCD onto, whereas a type A RCD will be able to fit on a typical MCB chassis. So that is something to consider. Um, so just like I said earlier, please, regardless of the built-in RDC DD protection, manufacturer's information will always um, supersede your judgment when it comes to designing these systems. So always check the manufacturer's information. For example, the Schneider EV Link, one of the most popular EV charging stations here in Australia, does not come with built-in 6 milliamp DC fault protection, which means that we have to install a type B RCD which is very difficult to retrofit if you have specified a type A RCD for that charger. Next slide, please. Um, so as I mentioned earlier in um, 
section P4.1. Each connecting point should be protected by its own RCD of at least type A, having a rated residual operating current not exceeding 30 milliamps. Um, where the charging station is equipped with a socket outlet or a vehicle connector, um, protective measures against DC fault protection should be taken, except where provided by the EV charging station. So if we do not have that um, fault protection, then we obviously need to apply for each connecting point an RCD type B or an RCD type A with an appropriate equipment that ensures the disconnection of supply in case of a DC fault current um, over 6 million. Next slide. Obviously, the other um, step that you have to take into consideration is protection against short current or overcurrent um, using an MCB or a miniature circuit breaker. Each connecting point should be supplied individually by a final sub-circuit protected by an overcurrent protective device complying with AS60898 um, and its other series. EV chargers that typically operate on a circuit less than 63 amps use miniature circuit breakers. So it's um, very easy to install um, a circuit breaker with a type ARCD that fits on a typical MCB chassis, or they can also be DIN rail mounted if you have a DIN rail mounted board. Next slide. As you move further up the range with DC chargers, they typically only support molded case circuit breakers, which um, operate on a circuit greater than 32 amps. These do not typically require an RCD. Um, but EV chargers can also be rated up to 300 kilowatts, which means a permanent load current of 450 to 480 amps. So compliance to these standards provides safe behavior during the entire life of the installation. Um, and obviously molded case circuit breakers would ensure that um, when you have high short circuit currents, um, temperature rise behaviors when nominal current is passing, um, you are essentially protecting your overall system from um, aging behavior terminals, insulation and um, electrical faults. Now. Again, because um, every charger is different, read the uh, manufacturer's man manual because, for example, the Tritium, one of the more popular EV DC chargers here in Australia, typically does not require a neutral because it only has a three core plus, which essentially means if you put in a RCD with an MCCB, um, it won't operate because the RCD will prevent it from running. So it's always important to check with the manufacturers before you specify any systems. Next slide. Now we'll just go over AS3000, um, which is essentially the electrical engineer's holy Bible when it comes to calculating um, max demands or designing an electrical system. So the maximum demand in a consumer mains taking into account the physical distribution and intended usage um, is calculated in essentially four manners, um, which is calculation, assessment, measurement, and limitation. The methodology that we're gonna typically use in this case is called calculation. Um, now, the reason why we do a maximum demand calculus is obviously to ensure that the upstream supply is adequate for the load that is going to be presented. And it's also to avoid damage to the upstream equipment and overcurrent protection devices. Next slide. Um, so calculation, the calculation method um, is when we calculate the max demand by um, measuring, sorry, I'll start over on that one. Um, maybe calculate in accordance with the guidance given in the standard for the appropriate type of electrical installation and electrical installation supply. Um, and for EV charges, they have, uh, for um, electrical installations, they have two tables, table C1, which is a guidance on residential installations and table C2, which gives us more guidance on commercial installations. Um, next slide. When it comes to residential installations, um, typically if you wanted to connect two to five living units per phase, which um, is essentially a seven kilowatt charger connected for one of the apartments, um, you can have up to 15 charges on three phases and you would have to consider 100% of the load of that EV charger. For example, if the design intent is to put in 20 EV charges at 32 amps each, the maximum demand would be 100% um, of the 90% um, of the connected load, approximately 202 amps, three phase. And if the design intent was to put, suppose, 68 EV charges, you would split the number of charges evenly across the three phases, and then multiply it by 32, and then have 75% of the connected load, so approximately 552 amps, three phase. In real world scenarios, we find that these values can be a bit different because um, typically residents plug in their EV chargers at exactly the same time and provides what's called a large coincidental load. So the diversification figures used in AS3000 may not necessarily be the best indication of what the building actually uses from day to day. Next slide. 
maximum demand for um, commercial applications is a bit different as well. Um, in a commercial setting, the high, maximum demand calculation for, um, needs to be the full uh, connected load of the highest EV charger plus 75% of the full load of the remaining charges. So if the design is to put 100 EV chargers at 32 amps single phase each, it will be assumed that one of those chargers will be running at 32 amps and 99 of those chargers will be running at 24 amps, which is essentially 75% of the 32 amps full rated current. This amounts the EV charging hardware uh, maximum for a commercial building to total 824 amps three phase, which essentially means that you would probably have to design a whole um, sw main switchboard just for EV charging. Uh, it means that your substation may require a secondary transformer um, because it's possible that you may be doubling, if not tripling the site's maximum demand, which um, any electrical engineer would know is a very painful exercise. Um, and typically is not feasible for most projects due to budgetary or electrical infrastructure constraints. Next slide. So there is a solution to this, um, load management. So load management systems typically optimize the power that's available and reduces the power supply required to charge the EVs. Next slide. Um, most LMSs have different ways of operating and features, but they essentially um, fall under the umbrella of these four core features. Um, they integrate with the existing building services supply um, to ensure EV charging only occurs when there's spare capacity available. The second feature is that they control the operation of individual EV chargers to ensure that available load is spread and rotated evenly amongst the connections. The third feature is that they control the time of EV charger operation to coincide with off-peak energy usage and reduce peak demand charges, so scheduled charging. And the fourth feature is essentially they would integrate with the existing systems for reporting of EV charging consumption, such as a BMS. Now, not all chargers do, not all load management systems do all of these things, but um, almost all load management systems do at least one of these things to ensure that we do not exceed the site's capacity for EV charging. Next slide. Um, so there's a few different types of load management systems. Um, for example, a static, um, and they're lumped together as either a static or a dynamic load management, where a static load management can only control an EV charging load based on a reference point, a singular reference point. So you set a limit on the EV charging for that site, and the charges will never exceed that limit. The second way of doing it is what's called a dynamic load management system, where you have um, two or more reference points where you can actually monitor the incoming supply to the site to not exceed a particular number, whether it's the um, main rate, max rating of the distribution board feeding the entire site, or it may be the supply offer that you received from the authorities when you made your DNSP application. Um, you may have a cloud or a local based um, load management system where a cloud-based LMS connects all the charges to the cloud and you have a cloud-based algorithm that allocates charge to each charger to ensure it does not um, in, um, go past the capacity of the site. There, there is a benefit to this because they are simpler to install. You do not have to run cabling to each site, uh, to each charger, but, uh, and it may end up being cheaper, but there may also be issues with latency and, um, um, what's the word? Um, latency and um, reliability. Whereas a local LMS requires more cabling and infrastructure, is more secure and reliable because they work on a local level with no requirement to upload details to the cloud. And the final type is um, whether it's an OCPP compliant um, open charger port protocol um, LMS or whether it's a proprietary LMS. An OCPP LMS can integrate with a range of manufacturers, hardware and software systems, whereas proprietary LMSs may only be able to work with their um, charges or their family of charges and not be able to integrate with any other charges that come out in the future from other brands. Next slide. So this is typically how a dynamic load management system works. Um, so I've used one of our own in-house load management systems as an example of how it uses the information it gets to work. Um, a load management system will query the main switchboard's power meter reading or reference point and perform a calculation to determine the site's electrical spare capacity based on supply current limitations, um, supply contracts, or peak demand limits. Um, there would be a secondary power meter on the EV charging section, whether it's a metered section to a supply or whether it's a distribution board feeding the charges. The LMS will query that section and perform calculations to determine whether a metered section's fair capacity is available based on that set limit. 
When the distribution board approaches its set limit, the load management system performs load shedding by dialing down the charging rate of each charging port to suit the capacity and delay the start of any new charging sessions through queuing until there is available capacity to um, restart charging. Next slide. A, a static load management system works extremely similarly to a dynamic load management system, except you only require one source of uh, one reference point. So essentially there would be either a power meter on the distribution board feeding the charges or the main switchboard. Um, and it'll ensure that based on the availability to the site, it won't let the distribution board um, approach its set limit and performs load shedding accordingly. Next slide. Um, in terms of commercial models, there's a few, there's two different ways we can go about this. The first way is a capital expenditure model where the building owner pays an upfront fee for the load management system and is responsible for the ownership, operation and maintenance of the load management system. The other option is through the operating expenditure model where the building owner pays an annual fee or he can pass on that annual fee to his um, tenants for the um, operation, maintenance and updates to the LMS. So the company that provides the load management system typically owns it for the lifetime of that system being installed in that building, but then they do not have to worry about maintenance and updates to load management system. Next slide. So in terms of provisioning for residential car parks, what should we allow for? Um, so we allow for a diversity of 20% for a residential car park. So if you're designing an apartment building, we like to diversify our charging figures down to 20%, which is in line with the draft NCC 2022 standards, which require 12 kilowatt hour um, available charge for each charging station installed um, over eight hours, which is essentially the same as 20% diversity. When all charging stations are plugged in overnight, each resident's EV will receive about 50 kilometers of range, which is the typical Australian's dri average driving distance every day. Um, but this is assuming that every single Australian is plugged in at the exact same time over, over the whole night. When an EV is fully topped up during this period, the spare electrical capacity will be allocated to other EV charging stations, um, which will allow more range for each EV. So now we have a table that essentially details for a 68 car bay um, apartment complex, where when we have 50% penetration for that car park and there's 34 electric vehicles for the site, without load management, we would have 384 amps three phase, whereas with load management, our max demand drops to 73 amps, which essentially allows, as a worst case scenario, 50 kilometers of range for each resident at 73 amps, which is a lot more um, feasible in integrating into your current max demand calculations. At 80% penetration and 55 car base, you require 680 amps three phase without load management, but with load management, you only require 118 amps, which is still within the boundaries of what we can um, integrate. And at 100% provisioning, 68 cars for the entire residential car park, 736 amps, which is again, quite a lot, but with 148 amps three phase, we allow 50 kilometers of range for each resident with overnight charging um, at its worst case scenario. But what we have found is that overnight charging typically has way more available capacity than you might expect as most residents are not using as much power and there's more available capacity for the EV charges. Next slide. So because we have design, um, put in a much lower maximum demand, it has a few implications. The load management is able to rotate operation of EV charges and share power across a time frame. Cable sizes to the distribution boards that are dedicated to EV charges and the busways that may we may potentially install in the future um, are reduced, which essentially brings down the cost of infrastructure for provisioning. The substation ob obviously would go down in size as well because we do not require a larger substation to accommodate the power usage for the site. Um, and as well as we would require less spatial for the MSD room. So we do not require a larger distribution board that has to be custom built. We can just go with an off the shelf MCB chassis distribution board that is able to 100% provision for the whole car park. Next slide. So in terms of a dynamic load management system, they typically require a few um, networking architectures that are involved as well. So the power meters that um, monitor the incomer and outgoer circuits have to be connected to the load management system, typically by a category six cable, um, as well as um, individual connections from the charges to the load management system via category six um, cabling. Um, they connect through um, 
the OCPP protocol between the LMS and the charges. And then the LMS also connects back to the building network to connect to the internet. This allows for remote access and remote commissioning by um, installers such as JetCharge, as well as third-party billing solutions like Chargefox to ensure that um, people can either find the charges online on using their phone apps or um, be billed appropriately based on their usage. Next slide. In terms of provisioning, what do we typically allow for? Distribution boards, we have two methods, a distribution board and cable tray method and a busway method. With the distribution board and cable tray method, we have a centralized distribution board located um, somewhere in the car park, essentially trying to be as central to the entire car park as possible. We like to locate them in on every level in the core of the car park, essentially so that we have the shortest possible cable runs from the charges back to the distribution board. The data racks are also positioned strategically throughout the car park to ensure that we do not exceed the 90 meter limit for category six cabling as running um, more than 90 meters would probably require additional contracts or um, fiber connections between the uh, data racks. We have obviously the load management system that controls the EV charging loads within the safe limits of the building. And cable trays are especially important because they provide a connection pathway from the DBEV to the communications rack um, from the charges. So DBEV to the charges and the communication rack to the charges will require their own dedicated communications and power cable trays. And it all, the other point is that they avoid large installations of surface conduits, um, which can not only be not, uh, unfeasible for larger installations, but can also be aesthetically not very pleasing. Next slide. With busways, we tend we can essentially run a distributed power system throughout the car park to provide a decentralized connection point for EV charging. So each circuit runs back to the busway, but does not have to go to a centralized distribution board. There is essentially a T-off unit with a circuit breaker in it that provides circuit protection to the charger. Um, the whole bus is electrified, which allows for modular installations of EV chargers, um, whereas the other benefit is that we do not have to run an individual power tray, power cable tray. We can just run it, run a singular sub mains to a feeder unit to the busways. And then the busway runs throughout the entire car park. We have obviously the data rack load management system and cable trays that provides a connection pathway from the comms rack to the EV, um, EV charges because we have to connect the comms rack to the EV charges to be able to load manage them. And obviously the other point is it avoids the large installation of surface conduit. Next slide. So when we use busways as provisional infrastructure, um, they are much smaller in footprint than a large cable tray and distribution board where you have to comply with um, the distribution board requirements um, of AS3000. Minimal footprint to cope with the spatial constraints. It's what much more elegant solution easier to conceal and a modular system that allows for easier retrofits in the case of car parks moving around. Um, here in Australia, we, this hasn't really taken off just yet, but in Europe, this is the go-to standard when it comes to installing EV charging stations throughout the car park, because it just allows for much easier installations because you do not have to size your cables to allow for the long volt drops between the distribution board and the EV charges. Next slide. So now we'll go over a really quick example project um, where we use both the cable tray and distribution board um, method and the busway method to see which option stacks up in terms of cost. Next slide. So this is a typical 68 car bay residential car park that you may have seen at least once throughout your career. Um, essentially each car bay has the provision for an EV charger. So the EV chargers are not installed as part of a day one install. There, the cable trays, distribution boards, comms racks are all run day one during the base build installation. And then as a tenant buys an electric vehicle, they'll get a charger installed and run it back to a centralized distribution board. So we have a 450 mil power cable tray that's sized for 68 circuits running throughout the car park to the distribution board for EV charging. Um, and this allows for the voltage drop and the cable sizes changing based on how far the run is. So the shortest cable run from the distribution board to the EV charge uh, distribution board to the EV charger is about 10 meters. And the longest cable run is 80 meters, which is just within the constraints of our 90 meters um, category six run to the comm track. So the, the line in blue represents the communications um, cable train 
and the line in red represents the power cable tray. So the power cable tray is obviously 450 mils. Um, the communications cable tray is 300 mil. That's assuming. Sorry, um, I saw a question earlier, but um, I'll get back to that one. So 300 mil communications cable tray, um, we size that based on a 6.1 millimeter diameter um, of a CAT6 cable. We allow for a 72 pole off the shelf MCB distribution board for EV charging and a communications rack with a total of 72 ports in it for each EV charger plus a few spares. Um, next slide. With, with the busway method, with the busway method, we essentially running the same reticulation throughout the car park with um, the communications cable tray being 300 mil as well but we eliminate the distribution board as well as the power cable tray. Um, the comms cable tray can either be mounted flush next to the busway or um, using a catenary arm mounted underneath the busway. Um, with the shortest cable run and the longest cable run being exactly the same from the busway to, to the distribution board. Next slide. So, what, how does the cost, cost stand up, stack up? So we've done a high level costing for both options with the base bill provisioning costs um, being 121,000 approximately for the busway solution and 80,000 for the cable train distribution board method using a seven kilowatt 32 amp single phase charger um, for each resident um, that typically costs about 1,000 to $3,000 per unit. We've used a $1,850 per unit charger as our option, um, as our example unit here costs about $125,000 to give every resident in the car park a charger. But with, because we're running much shorter cable runs, we essentially have a cheaper installation cost for all, once all the backbone infrastructure is placed in. So at the end of our um, EV charging installation, once everyone has taken up an EV, we've allowed for a $357,000 budget for the busway solution. But that number goes up by 100,000 for the cable train distribution board method, which is our more traditional method, um, which is a better outcome for the client, as well as for the electricians who have to install the charges um, after the fact, because they do not have to run the cabling back to a distribution board, um, which saves on a lot of cost. And that's it in terms of the design considerations that we take in terms of EV charging. Thanks, JSL. Um, I'm going to jump in now and discuss a um, short section on the billing. Um, and there's currently two billing approaches that we, we see um, used at the moment. So there's a user pays approach um, through a third party uh, billing software. Um, we can um, also do that via um, APIs. And then there's also some NMI metering requirements that are quite important, um, which we'll touch on. Firstly, and just linking this to the LMS requirements. So typically uh, when we install a load management system, uh, the most suitable method of obtaining a supply and connection um, for the EV charging system and the load management system um, is by a one central connection point um, in the MSB. And so that means that when it comes to the metering of that, there's only gonna be one meter. Um, uh, and that means that we'll then need to build, if, if it's say a residential apartment like JSL's example, um, the, the DBEV or the busway will be connected from the metered section, the common power of the building. Um, and then that means that there's only one entity that pays the energy consumption for all the EV charging um, energy usage. And so that means that we need some, some method to um, recoup those costs uh, to the energy account holder and make sure that the um, individual EV charger owner is paying for the energy consumed through their charges. So just on um, NMI pattern approved metering. So whenever there's a meter being used for trade purposes, um, we need this meter to be pattern approved and verified by NMI. So whenever we do um, billing um, via an EV charger, the EV charger will have to be a smart charger. Um, so it can have access to reporting that data. And those smart chargers will have an internal meter um, for us to bill a, a user for the consumption through that meter that that meter is recording, we'll need that meter to be an NMI pattern approved meter. Um, and so this is, uh, yeah, 
has been quite a, I guess, a recent clarification uh, from the NMI. Uh, and it's still ongoing discussions about this because a lot of EV charges don't currently come with a patent approved meter. Um, so if you want to use the billing, you'll need to retrofit um, an NMI patent approved meter on the installation or in the charger, uh, which can increase costs. Now to a, a method in which we do bill the users um, for the energy consumed through their charger. We can use third-party billing agents. Um, so I've listed three out there that um, offer a software platform um, that allows uh, the, the billing um, of the energy consumption. So an EV owner will need to create an account with one of these billing agents. Um, they often have an app, so you can register your account through the app and link your credit card. The billing provider and the energy account holder then agree on a on a tariff, a fee to charge the end user for the energy consumption through the charger. And then so the, the EV, char EV driver will use the charger. They might use it for four hours and maybe they'll consume 20 kilowatts, kilowatt hours. Um, and then they'll pay a certain fee for that. And it'll be um, debited from their credit card linked to their account. The billing provider will then um, collect all those funds and they might do it for a building of 50 res or maybe there's 68 residents like JSL said in his example. They'll collect um, all the individual um, bit, bits of revenue from EV owners in that building, um, hold on to that for probably up to a month typically, and then send those funds over to the energy account holder of the building. So that ensures a full cost recovery. Essentially, the billing provider collects those funds from the individual EV owners and then reimburses um, the energy account holder so that all energy consumption that they've paid for in their monthly bills um, is fully recovered. Another really neat way in which we can um, offer a billing solution um, is via API calls. So depending on the charger and the, and the, and the system implemented at a building, um, this is really useful uh, for residential sites with embedded network operators uh, because it allows for a really nice product for the end, um, for, the, for the clients and for, for the individual residents in that building uh, because the embedded network operator can just um, obtain the data the consumption data via an api from the ev charges and then they can just implement that consumption data into their existing um, billing systems and essentially they can just add add that um ev charging consumption as a single line item um, on their existing energy bill um, and so that's just a really neat package for the um individual resident because they can see how much energy they, they've consumed at their apartment but also at their um, ev charger this also allows for really neat dashboards to be um, built depending on um, the functionality that um, might be required in a building, uh, but really good for reporting and um, user interfacing. Now I've got another um, quick section just on solar and V2G. Uh, and this is yeah, really looking to, to the future, part, especially in the vehicle to grid charging. Um, so in terms of solar, we can maximize the on-site uh, on-site renewables um, if you install EV chargers, uh, especially when you've got a low export tariff for solar, it can be really useful to utilize as much of that um, uh, power coming in from your panels uh, and, and utilize that for EV charging um, just to save yourself on, on cost as much as you can. Um, one difficulty here though is that uh, this is only going to be used when, when um, there's solar available during the day. So I guess where we most see this as beneficial is workplace charging. Um, as with COVID happening, we're all working from home a lot more. Uh, I guess it might be suitable um, for, for home and um, residential apartment charging. Uh, but again, we do typically um, take advantage of off-peak power in those settings. Uh, so this, this kind of solar and EV charging synergy doesn't align as well there as it does in a, in a workplace setting where EV charging would, might be occurring during the day. In terms of vehicle to grid, this is one of the most exciting um, directions that uh, we can go with electric vehicles. And we're, really it's where we see mobility and energy collide. All of a sudden um, you've got a vehicle with you know 40 to 80 kilowatt hours of capacity. Um, and yeah, you can use that to export that back to your house, your building um, to, to provide a range of um, services uh, that are still being investigated and I guess commercially um, uh, determined. So this is yeah, really exciting technology. We can um, go either way. So, you know, during the day you can charge up 
uh, your electric vehicle with your solar. And then overnight, you might be able to export that um, contained energy in the battery back into your house to charge your, um, to, to, to um, service your appliances and your overnight usage. Um, so that, yeah, kind of, you can see that working really well in a, in a residential house. Um, and you can essentially become off grid if you're smart enough with your um, solar and, and EV um, electrical charging. And then um, there's only two vehicles, unfortunately, that currently have this functionality. There's the Mitsubishi Outlander and the Nissan Leaf. So both Japanese um, manufacturers that um, use the Chatamo plug. Um, the CCS2, the Chatamo plug was, the, was the, one of the DC charging plug types. The other one being the CCS2 plug, um, which we're expecting to be able to have this functionality by 2025. And that's when we really expect um, this vehicle to grid charging to be widely accessible. The, the, the charger you can see on the left there is one, one of the only vehicle to grid chargers currently on the market um, called the Wallbox Quasar. Um, and that's got a, a seven kilowatt vehicle um, bi-directional um, charging capacity. And where we see this having huge implications and opportunities is, is with interaction with grid operators. Um, you can imagine that in the long run um, with, with EV penetration growing, all of a sudden, uh, yeah, you've got all these mobile 40 to 80 kilowatt hour um, batteries. And if we can tap into their stored capacity, um, that could have huge implications um, and, and opportunities um, with balancing the grid and providing grid services. So one trial we're currently doing um, in partnership with ARENA, the ACT government, ActuA Geo, Evo Energy, Nissan, SG Fleet, and ourselves um, is, a, is a vehicle to grid charging trial where 51 of the um, Nissan Leafs in the ACT government fleet uh, um, are yeah, taking part in this trial to assess what financial incentives might come out of vehicle to grid charging, seeing, seeing how we can encourage um, this up, the uptake of this technology. So the way it works in, in this trial is that um, we're working with Arena. So Arena will give us, uh, I guess, prompts as to when there might be a, a, a drop or an increase in frequency beyond um, the, the limits that they, they like to retain it within. And so if they give us that signal, we can then quickly instruct our um, vehicle to grid charges to either import energy to the vehicle or export energy from the vehicle back into the grid. And if we've got enough vehicles all available, um, we can rebalance that uh, the the the, the, the um, drop out in frequency and hopefully avoid a blackout. So one really um, interesting thing about this is that the 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 fleet operators, the owners of these Nissan Leafs, they'll simply get paid by um, by by Arena to be on standby. So they'll just get paid to be available to offer this service and might never happen. Um, and they might never have to export their capacity back into the grid. They simply get paid to be uh, to have that availability to do so. So we're really excited to see um, where this goes and what commercial opportunities this brings up. If we look forward to 2040, um, we'd expect essentially 100% of vehicles on our roads to be electric. So you can imagine then we're, we're, we're talking um, a million megawatt hours as an estimate of, of capacity within mobile vehicle batteries. Uh, to think what we could be doing with that um, in, in, in 20 years' time. Uh, there's going to be heaps of opportunities there to see how we can provide grid services and um, yeah, integrate with these grid operators. And that's all we've got for you today. Um, so we hope that was an informative and useful presentation on, on EV charging and, and um, where we see the connections to building services and the opportunities for the future. And yeah, I'd love to hear any questions that anyone's got. That was really awesome, Tate and Jersil. I um I thought that was really good actually. I don't, to be honest, I don't expect there's going to be too many questions because it was actually so detailed and so thorough. You probably answered everything that anyone could ever think of. Um, but we do have a couple here, so I'll just I run see a few them. questions pop down. Yeah, so uh, we've got one here from Ashan. He just. Uh, wants you to explain how the load management system interacts with an existing building management system. Yeah, so um, typically we'll talk about our load management system because we know that one the best. 
our load management system has what's what I call API calls, which are essentially ways to talk to the load management system. So when an integration needs to happen, we would uh, incorporate our software developers to work in um, conjunction with the BMS commissioners um, and commissioning engineers. And what they would do is they would have access to those API calls to get the information that they need to integrate with the um, building management system. So the integration process is different depending on what kind of building um, management system they want to integrate into their building. But the process is still the same and it just depends on what kind of information they want and what they want to do with it. Excellent. So Chris has asked a question, which I know we talked about last night. Um, so I know what the answer is going to be already, but Chris is asking, how do we overcome the fire risk of large numbers of EVs being parked adjacent to each other in basements? Which yeah. Which is being so, by fire engineers. Yeah. So essentially the risk, of fire typically comes from external damage to the battery pack, um, which causes what's called thermal runaway. Now, older electric cars and relatively new ones as well use a lithium ion battery as their main battery pack. Now, the issue with lithium ion is that as the electronics are packed so densely together, any sort of piercing using either shrapnel from an accident or just you know a large amount of pressure or mechanical um, puncture wounds on, on the battery pack causes it to spontaneously combust as the circuits short circuit. Um, that obviously would be quite dangerous and an, it's an explosive risk and it's something that we are currently working with the fire and rescue department at New South Wales to do a large scale study on to see if we can somehow um, mitigate those risks. Newer cars such as the BYD um, ATO3 and even the Tesla Model 3 standard comes uh, with a lithium ion um, polymer battery. Um, essentially, that battery has what's called um, a blade battery that's made in-house by the BYD, the Chinese manufacturer. Those batteries are quite stable at um, when you pierce them with shrapnel or whether you know, they have a large amount of force applied to them. So they don't have that same amount of fire risk. So they are much safer than the um, comparative internal combustion engine vehicle. So if we say that this car is a fire risk because of the battery technology, then so is an internal combustion engine vehicle. So I hope that answers your question, Chris. It's probably a, a question that's got a more, much more detailed answer and a lengthy answer that's gonna get developed over time once the standards start to catch up with the technology. And I'm sure in Victoria, at least, Fire Rescue Victoria is probably going to have a say soon around what we need to do to, to protect them when fighting fires. Um, so definitely something to look out for in the future. Just a uh, correction, we'll it was a lithium iron phosphate battery, not lithium iron polymer. So I just remembered that that was a bit of a mistake that I want to clarify. Yeah, thanks. Easy. And now we do have some anonymous questions. So... Um, Anonymous attendee has asked, is Ethernet provisioning required for all EV charges? No. So it depends on the load management system that you typically like to specify. For example, Tesla's own in-house load management system uses Wi-Fi to um, communicate between charges. So they don't use the OCPP protocol to talk to each other over Wi-Fi. Um, or if they do, it's a very locked in protocol. That protocol is open to interpretation based on what charges use and what kind of load management system they want. But Typically, the kind of load management systems that we use here at JetCharge and how they how we communicate with those charges, they require Category 6 RJ45 cabling to connect from the charges to the load management system. In the case where if you have longer cable runs, you may have to use fiber with the fiber termination block at the end of it to connect via CAT6. So every charging station is different and how they communicate with their respective load management systems also changes based on what you're trying to achieve. Just to jump in there as well, at the start, we discussed the, the di difference, difference between smart and dumb chargers. So yeah, for all dumb chargers, there's, there's absolutely no need um, for Ethernet. There's, there's, there's no connectivity to those ones. Yeah, it's just the power delivery unit, essentially, at its core. Easy. And our second last question, can your load management system talk to any EV charger? 
Hypothetically, yes, but at the moment, we are only compatible with a handful of charges that use the OCCP, uh, OCPP protocol. There are other charges that also use the OCC, OCPP protocol, but we haven't had a chance to integrate those charges with our load management system. The reason for that is because just because they all use the same OCPP protocol does not necessarily mean they inter the engineers who program that protocol to talk to over that protocol uses the same way of communicating. Um, an OCPP protocol is just a protocol and different interpretations of that protocol would mean that we have to write different firmwares to integrate with those charges when we do our load management system. So they're all different depending on what kind of charges we integrate. In terms of what charges we can support, um, most of the Schneider charges we support that use the OCPP protocol, um, obviously our own in-house charger. Um, Tritium, most of their charges that um, are installed out, the DC charges, they're supported, as well as a, a few other wide range of charges from ChemPower, ABB, and um, I'm forgetting the last one, but I'm sure, Tate, if it comes up to you, I'm sure you'll fill them in on it, but yeah. I believe it was Quasar is in the works as well, but the wall box charges are in the works, but they haven't been integrated just yet. Yeah, there's always a constant pipeline of charges that are being in, of manufacturers that we're integrating with the systems. Um, so yeah, we're always bringing more charges online. Um, and yeah, the, the, the important component of that all is, is, is to select an open charge point protocol system, because if it's not open charge point protocol, chances are you'll just be locked into one manufacturer. Um, whereas we, we believe it's really important to have that wide range of manufacturers that you can integrate with in, in, in case your charging needs change or um, there's a, a better charger from a different manufacturer that suits your needs. Um, before I go to the next question, Akram has kindly pointed out that Ashan has also provided a response to Chris's question about fire risk. Um, oh, so cool. everyone, please check the Q&A section. Um, there's also a link there to Fire New South Wales. So everyone, please have a look. Um, that should answer everything because that's a very detailed response. So thank you for that. Thanks, Vishant. Um, and now I guess two more questions and I might actually combine them into one. So what is Jet Charge's experience and capability in it assisting or designing EV charging systems in buildings and when should we engage Jet Charge for advice on EV charging systems? Um, in terms of greenfield projects, as soon as humanly possible. Um, from the moment you know that you're going to install EV charging in that building, engage us early, tell us what you what your design intent is, whether you want to do 100% provisioning, 50%, you want communal charges, residential charges, um, what kind of building it is, what is the load that is available. We can work with you to design the system as well as tell you how we can integrate load management into your building. Um, as well as cater to the requirements. If you come to us a few weeks before construction starts, they mean we, we're essentially reverse engineering the single line diagrams that you've made two years ago, which makes it all, it's essentially as good as a brownfield site at that point, sometimes even harder because um, it's hard to convince the builders that you want to put in the provisioning now versus if you had just allowed for it during your specification in tender. Yeah, so as soon as possible is my best answer to that one. And in terms of our capability um, in this space, we've had a, a dedicated Greenfields team uh, for the past two years um, solely working on um, EV charging uh, designs within this space kind of at that early stage um, engagement with, with the engineers, um, going back and forth to um, educate and inform how our energy management system can be integrated. And just, yet, yeah, I guess, as we, as we discussed, the, the results of that are, so so important in terms of the substation design your msb sizing and so often when you know we have those early conversations especially two years ago when the technology was all quite new um that that was yeah a huge help um in, in getting in early because we could inform the engineers as to um yeah how you could reduce the sizing of all your infrastructure while still achieving a suitable um ev charging end product um and then in in, in terms of uh, designing them for existing buildings. Um, yeah, we've, we've, we've similarly been doing that for the last two years, um, assessing and, and designing suitable systems based on input from, from clients and engineers. Easy. Last question. So we might make this the last question for the night. Oh, it's two questions now. Thanks, James. 
have you mixed different charges using OCCP in one car park? For example, one with a higher charging rate for say one charging bay than more regular AC charges for the remaining bays? And what is the break even point in terms of quantity of charging bays on when someone should consider moving from dumb charges to a load management system based charging system? Yeah, I can, I can jump in on the on the first point of that with regard to mixing AC and DC charging. So we work with a lot of the vehicle uh, manufacturers, the OEMs, uh, have partnerships with 21 of the um, OEMs in the country. And so we've been working with them on a number of dealership rollouts. So we've installed um, high power, fast chargers for say the Porsche Taycan, because that's one of the few charger, few vehicles that can really accept a, up, I think up to that 175 kilowatt. Um, so we put in 175 kilowatt charges at their dealerships, as well as um, smaller AC chargers. Uh, similar at BMW and Mercedes, we've got fast chargers um, in the same areas as, as slower AC chargers. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's been the, plenty of those implementations. In terms of when to go from dumb chargers to smart chargers, I guess it, it really comes down to the... Um, the sizing of the infrastructure and the design, you're, if you only need a couple of charges and it's not going to um, have huge impact on, on design and costings of the infrastructure, then, then you can go ahead and, and follow the AS3000 AS um, max demand cal requirements. But once you kind of get into complex um, systems and, and large amounts of charges, uh, it becomes really important to, to looking at, start looking into load management. Excellent. Well, it seems that that will wrap the night up. So, look, I personally love that. That was really, really informative. So I'm hoping everyone really enjoyed it. Just like to say thank you, Tate. Thank you, Jaisel. That was Thanks. very good. Really appreciate it. Um, this will get recorded. Um, and once the recording is available, we'll, we'll share it around uh, by email and will also come up on the CPC website. So, look, thanks very much, everyone. Really appreciate it. And we'll call it a night. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks, guys. Have a good night. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. See ya.